We always want to prove what good Americans we are. The very first man to die for the War of Independence in this country was a black man named Crispus Adams. Crispus Adams. He was a fool. A civil rights leader, anti-war, activist, and pan-African revolutionary, Stokely Kamaika is best known for popularizing the slogan, Black Power, which in the mid-1960s galvanized a movement toward more militant and separatist assertions of black identity, nationalism, and empowerment. Watch and pay attention. Well, why talk about dynamite sticks if Molotov cocktails won't work? When you talk of black power, building a movement that will smash everything that Western civilization has created. When you say that black power should bring the country to its knees any time it messes with the black man, and these are quotes from Stokely Carmichael, uh, the picture has got to be, in the mind of white man and black man, one of a man who threatens violence. On the contrary. If you say that you have to bring the country to its knees if it messes with a black man, you're saying that the only protection for black people is that they unite. So that when one black man is touched because he's black, there's some protection for him. Now, it's obvious that that protection does not exist in this country. It does not now exist. And the only people who can have that protection are black people. And black people know that. Now, white people may not know that. So it means that you have to build a movement so strong in this country that if one black man is touched, every black man will rise up and let this country know they're not going to tolerate it. If one man, one black man is touched. That's right, because he's black. I mean, if a black man is walking down the streets of Mississippi, down a highway with a Bible in his hand, he is shot because he is black. That's one incident. Oh, I can name you a lot of others, and you know that yourself. In the northern ghettos, if one black man in California is driving his pregnant wife to the hospital and he is shot by a white racist policeman, I can name you more incidents. Then you're saying fight violence with violence. I am saying that we must build a movement of black people that will protect ourselves so that we are willing to stop that by any means necessary. Now, I'm not concerned about the question of violence. It seems to me that that will depend upon how, in fact, white people respond. If white people, in fact, are willing not to bother with black people because they are black, then there's going to be no question of violence. When you read stories about difficulties, riots in Omaha or Cleveland or Brooklyn or Chicago or wherever... I call them rebellions. They're rebellions. And you, you see nothing wrong with them? I think that it is people who are rebelling against a system that has locked them inside tight of ghettos that exploits and oppress them and they have no means of redress to break that system down. The question of whether or not violence is going to be used is not a question for the black community. It's a question for white America. Because white America is the one who's used violence. For 400 years we have been the recipients of violence. We have never lynched. We have never shot, we've never burned the church, we've never beaten people, we've never taken them to jail. That is the question for white America. The real question is can she civilize herself before we get ready to civilize her? And we're just not concerned about the Vietnam War per se. We are concerned about the survival of black people in this country. You're one black man who went to a good essentially white high school in the city of New York. That's you correct. obviously had had a good education. That's a good many of the people who work with you here in SNCC can say the same thing. And we're saying that... And you're a black man who came from a New York ghetto. And we're saying that there's a system that allows for one or two black people to get out. And that that's the rationale for keeping other black people down. And it has nothing to do with the unwillingness or inability of the Negro to help himself and to work hard. That's the rationale that the reason why black people aren't this is because they're lazy, unambitious, stupid, have rhythm, and they eat watermelon. You call on the black man to refuse to respond to his draft call. That is correct. And we will continue to do so while there's breath in our bodies. Do you really believe that the military policies of the United States are designed to exterminate the black man, as you've said? I most certainly do. I look at the recent statement by racist McNamara, who says that 30% 
of the people that are going to be drafted now under his new system are going to be black people. And that's nothing more than black urban removal. The white liberal who supported civil rights for so long with time and effort and money. What is your feeling about him? Well, I think that there's no reason why they should stop supporting the movement now. I certainly feel that if they're genuinely interested in black people, and since black people have charted a course, they believe in that program, they will continue to give to it. They need more white people to civilize whites. They need them to civilize the savages in Cicero who throw rocks and bricks at a peaceful and lovable black man like Dr. Martin Luther King, who would not even hurt a fly. And that's very important, because our uncles and our fathers and our older brothers died in World War I fighting Nazism to protect the Poles. And those same Poles turn around and throw rocks and bricks at us after we died to save their lives. And people talk about we are savages. Mr. Carmichael, if you had the chance to stand up in front of the white community and say anything you desired, say to him, understand me, white man, what would you say? I would say, understand yourself, white man, that the white man's burden should not have been preached in Africa, but it should have been preached among you that you need now to civilize yourself. You have moved to destroy and disrupt. You have taken people away. You have broken down their systems and you have called all that civilization. And we who have suffered at this are now saying to you, you are the killers of the dreams. You are the savages. Yes, it is you who have always been un civilized civilize yourself our problem has been as black people we've always been concerned about white america never about us and what we've always thought is that white america equal the same interest as us that is not true we must now be concerned with us let me give you some examples we always want to prove what good americans we are the very first man to die for the war of independence in this country was a black man named Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks. He was a fool. Because here he was dying for white folk freedom and millions of his brothers were enslaved in the very country. Oh, but we wanted to prove what great Americans we were. We begged the white folk to let us fight in the war of independence and they said no. So we organized ourselves in bands of armies, training ourselves with our bare foot to prove to the white folk what great Americans we were. Please let us fight, white folk. And finally they came and inspected our troops and said, good niggas, you can fight. And they had us fighting the Indians. Like fools, we should have teamed up with the Indians and <laughs> take care of you know who. Stokely Carmichael was born in 1941 in Trinidad and Tobago and moved to the United States at the age of 11. Certainly in the Bronx, New York, he quickly became aware of the racial injustice that black people faced in America. Carmichael's activism began in earnest during his time at Owen University, where he joined the Student Nonviolent Coordination Community, or SNCC. Kamaka was deeply influenced by the non-violent principle of Martin Luther King Jr. and the teachings of figures like Gandhi. However, as he became more involved in the movement, his views began to evolve, reflecting a growing frustration with the slow pace of change. In 1966, during the march against fear in Mississippi, Kamaka was arrested for the 27th time. Upon his release, he delivered a speech that would change the course of civil rights movement. We have been saying freedom for six years, he declared. What we are going to start saying now is black power. The phrase resonated with many African Americans who were disillusioned with the slow progress of nonviolence activism. Black power was more than a slogan. It was a call for self-determination, pride, and a new way of thinking about the struggle for equality. Kamaka was advocating for black people to take control of their own communities and to reject the passive acceptance of white supremacy. Kamaka's influence extended beyond the United States. 
After stepping down as the chairman of the SNCC, he joined the Black Panther Party, where he served as the party's prime minister. However, his vision was broader than just national politics. He was deeply committed to the global struggle against imperialism and colonialism. Kamaka traveled extensively in Africa, meeting with leaders like Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Seko Ture of Guinea. He saw the fight for black liberation in America as part of the larger struggle of freedom and dignity across the African diaspora. In 1969, he moved to Guinea, where he adopted the name Kwame Ture in honor of his African heroes. Stokely Kamaka's legacy is profound and enduring. His call for black power inspired a generation of activists and became a foundational concept in the fight for racial justice. From the Black Panther Party to today's Black Lives Matter movement, Kamaka's ideas continue to influence the struggle for equality. Kamaka taught us the importance of self-determination and pride in our identity. He understood that true liberation comes from within and that we must take control of our own destiny, not wait for others to grant us freedom. Stokely Kamaka was more than just a leader. He was a revolutionary thinker who challenged the world to see black people as powerful, proud, and deserving of respect. His voice still echoes today, reminding us that the fight for justice is far from over. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and share your thoughts in the comment box below. Until next time, cheers and have a good one.